All right, and this week we are going to talk about user privileges and permissions. I got a new microphone this week, so hopefully it sounds a little better. Some folks are complaining that my uh, my my audio was hard to hear in some of my videos, so hopefully it's a little bit better. Um, it certainly looks more fancy, my microphone. All right, so our topics this week, we're going to talk about the uh, shadow password suite, which is traditional Unix uh, authentication. Uh, and then we're going to talk about user groups and privileges and permissions. This should be a review from what you've covered in, uh, in your other Linux classes. And then uh, we're also going to talk about pluggable authentication modules, or PAM, which is the standard authentication mechanism in Linux in most modern distros. Uh, this is kind of ubiquitous at this point using PAM. No one really uses just the password and shadow files anymore, right? Pam is usually doing that authentication for us. And then we'll talk about uh, other authentication mechanisms other than Pam with Unix authentication. Um, LDAP and NIS are two that I'll talk about in this unit in detail, but there are others like Active Directory can be used with Linux. Um, you know, you can connect to an Active Directory network, which is Microsoft. Uh, you can also use, you know, Kerberos and things like that, but but we're going to, and also even, you know, OpenAuth and things like that could theoretically be used. Um, but we're going to talk mostly about uh, PAM and LDAP, right? Those are going to be our, our main focuses. I think those are the two most common that you'll find in the real world. So the password shadow suite, this is uh, known as Unix authentication, right? Uh, this is the traditional Unix authentication mechanism. You'll have a couple files. There's the Etsy password file, which contains all of the user accounts in a single file. You've got a group file, which contains all of your group names. And then you'll have... Um, Oh, I have it in there twice for some reason. And then you'll have your uh, your shadow file. Uh, I don't, you know, I got a typo in here. There should have been a shadow. One of those groups should say Etsy shadow. I apologize for that. But I actually do show it to you here in, in my little animation. So an Etsy password, it's a very simple uh, file. You know, Active Directory and, and LDAP are pretty complicated in how they manage user accounts. But um, Unix password file is pretty simple, right? Just like everything else in Unix, it's, it's all very elegantly simple in my opinion. Um, but it's really just a list of all the user accounts. Um, you'll have their UID and their GID, which is the group ID. So that'll tell you which group they belong to. Um, you'll have their home directory and then what shell they can use, right? Which you're gonna see in my demonstration. Um, you'll also see for the password, it's just gonna have the letter X. Um, so by default, in most modern distros of Linux, uh, they're not going to show the actual password in this file, right? Um, and then you have this shadow file, which is where you'll find the password. Everything else here isn't really too important. What's important is that in this file, you're going to find the user's password. So it's it's stored separately, right? Um, the password file is needed by a lot of applications that need to reference user accounts, right? If you want to see a list of users on your system, you just show the contents of the password file, right? So you don't want it to have anything that has to do with the password being stored in that file where everyone can access it. But the shadow file is uh, is more restricted and has the actual password hash. Now, back in the old, old days of Linux, or actually really Unix, not Linux, in the old days of Unix, this all, this all predates Linux, um, you had a password file that had the password in that file in plain text, right? It was very trusting back in those days, back in the 60s and 70s, right? Um, very quickly, people learned that was not a good idea, so they started using a hash to store that file. Of course, in the early days, it would have been MD5, right? I don't believe it's MD5 anymore. I think it's uh, something else. I can't remember, but <coughs> excuse me. So in any event, um, that password was eventually transitioned to being a hash, and then go forward in time a little further, and people said, you know, maybe it's not such a good idea to have the hash right in that password file where anybody could see it. So let's put that in a separate file, in the shadow file, and, and elevate the permissions in order to access the shadow, right? Because you could run, um, you could brute force attack and find out what somebody's password is if, you know, if you have access to the hash, right? I'll talk about that in more detail when we do our demonstration for this. Um, but back in this, so there's our username and there's our password that matches up, right? So they're going to match up from that uh, Etsy password file. Now, in the old days, you used to have to run a command. You won't be able to run this on CentOS because uh, CentOS because this is going back in time. But you used to have to actually, um, you could actually revert from the shadow file and move. You can tell Unix to move that password back into the password file. And the reason they did that is there's a lot of legacy applications that required the hash to actually be in the password file. Now, the reason for that was older applications used to do their own authentication for users, like an old FTP server or something, right? 
So imagine an old FTP server, the user goes to log in, it's going to capture their password, it's going to do an MD5 hash, and it's just going to go look up on its own in the password file to see if it matches, right? It's not going to ask anyone else to do that for it, it's going to do it on its own. With PAM, which we're going to talk about later, no one does that anymore. Now they do a call to uh, libpam.so, and it does the, uh, the authentication for you, right, with Unix, and it does all this stuff on the back end, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. You don't have to worry about you know, the, uh, the hashing and the salts in the hash and all that stuff, right? It just handles it for you. You collect their password, pass it to libpam, and it's going to do that authentication. Now, if you happen to be on a system that reverted to the old way of doing things where the uh, password is in the password file in CentOS, you can run the pwconv command, and that's going to take the password hashes in the password file, and it's going to move them back to shadow and replace them with Xs in the password file so you can transition it to the more secure method, right? So something definitely you could check on a Linux machine that you're responsible for to see if that's happening. And if it is, you know, you might want to check to see if there is an older application that needs that setting. So let's take a look at uh, the, how to manage our, uh, our user accounts, a little bit about user account management and some of the settings we have in Linux. We're gonna start pretty, pretty basic here. The first thing is, um, if we go into the Etsy directory, there's a uh, folder called default, and I forgot my forward slash on the front here, but one of the files you'll find in there is uh, user ad, right? So if I use VI to edit user ad, you got some settings in here. So this is the defaults when you run the user ad command. It's gonna create your user and put it in the, in whatever group is has the group ID of 100. It's gonna set the home directory to be inside slash home so this if you wanted to change where your home directories are this is where you would change it i've seen some people foolishly go in here and set this to slash usr right uh and usr is definitely not the right place to put the home directories but uh, i've certainly seen uh, people do that um and then down here there's a couple other things interesting one is the shell uh, you don't necessarily have to give people the bash shell right there's other shells like the corn shell and so forth um, so in theory, you could give, you know, you could set this up so that when someone logs in, they have a different shell. You can also take this out entirely so they don't have a shell. So that means when they log in, they've got nothing, right? Uh, theoretically, you could do that. And then the scale command is, or the scale uh, directive tells it where to go to get the folder structure that it's going to create. So it's going to create files and folders when it creates. So everything that's in the scale directory, which is short for skeleton, it's going to copy into the new home directory it creates when it creates the user account. So this is how you get that default folder structure. And as of right now, you know, with the default CentOS that we installed, we don't have a default skeleton uh, in there. So when you're creating your user accounts right now, there is no, um, there's no files or folders for that user when they first create their account. So this is where you would change that. Um, so that's some of the basic stuff in here. I'm gonna leave this stuff alone. We don't really need to change any of this. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and quit that file but let's go into the uh, Etsy scale directory and you can see there's really nothing in here so I'm gonna make some folders I'm gonna make one um, let's see we'll make a folder called uh, images and then I'll make one called documents and then uh, I guess that'll be it. So images and documents, right? So now when a user logs in, they're going to automatically get a, a one not log when they log in, when their account gets created, it's going to have images and documents in there, right? So if we run the user add command, and I'm going to create a user called, I'm going to just call mine student two. So the account's been created. And now if we go into LS home, there's student two. And if we look at uh, student two's directories, Assuming I did this right, you've got documents and images by default, right? So it created that folder structure. You can put all kinds of stuff in there. So anything that you want to curate that they're gonna have when they first log in, you could put in there. Now, how does the system uh, store user accounts, right? Where's the database of user accounts? And it's, it's pretty primitive uh, compared to how Microsoft works. So Microsoft, right, with Microsoft uh, Server, and I'm not talking the workstation, right? Server in Linux, in my opinion, is more kind of an equivalent to server. Um, it just has a file, right? It's just a file that has all your user accounts. Now in practice, it's not common for us to administer Linux systems where we're using that, uh, that file. We usually use something else, which we're gonna talk about later in the, uh, in the lecture this week. But let's take a look 
at that file. So that's going to be, I'm just going to use a VI to take, a, actually, I'm going to use cat because I don't want to edit that file. But I'm going to take a look at forward slash Etsy forward slash PASSWD. Now, when you look at that file, there's a bunch of stuff in here, right? You have the first field. Uh, so let's take a look at the one that says student two. The first field, student two, is the username. Then the next field is their password, which is always just going to be an X. And then uh, you have the, uh, the user ID, the group that they belong in, right? And then uh, if, there, if, you if you use, there's a, uh, an old GE, uh, you know, I think we covered this earlier, that GE was one of the, um, the earlier innovators of Unix. And there's, uh, there's a value sometimes you'll find in here that has to do with the uh, GE's authentication mechanism from Multics. Um, but then you'll also see in here um, the uh, default home directory for that user and also their shell, right? So you could actually go in here and change this if you wanted to, right? If you went in here and edited this file, you could change their home directory, you could change their default uh, shell, right? There's better ways to do that, but you certainly could do it in here. Now, the other file you're gonna find is the shadow file. So storage, I uh, can't talk today, stored separately is gonna be the shadow file, which has the password. Now, notice what's missing for my student two user account, there is no password hash, right? Um, the, the two exclamation points indicate that there's no password for this user account yet. Uh, and there are other accounts in here that have no password. Now, once I create a password, so if I use the password command, right, P-A-S-S-W-D, uh, I'm gonna add one for student two, and I'm gonna make it something really simple. And that's it. So now if I go and look in shadow, you can see student two now has a password hash, right? And generally these password hashes by default, uh, I, I think there's, they, they used to be MD5 hashes uh, with assault, but I think they've, they're they using something different now. I can't remember, um, but it's uh, it, it might be, um, I know it's not MD5 anymore, but I can't remember. Maybe I'll ask you a question in the quiz and you can you can do some research and figure out what, what this password hash actually is, right? But it's basically one way, right? You cannot decrypt the password from the hash, right? You can't take that hash and do some unencryption to get it back, right? It's not that kind of encryption. It's one-way encryption, meaning that um, it's basically a unique value that's calculated from the password itself and they're a fixed length, so they're always the same. doesn't matter how long your password is or how short your password is, right? So it really doesn't give you any clue as to what their password is. Now, how do people generally crack passwords? Really, the, the probably the, the easiest way to crack passwords is to get that password hash and feed it through a utility that tries to find a match for that password hash. And there's a couple different ways to do that. One way is you can brute force it, where you keep trying different passwords until you get the same hash. Obviously, that's not very efficient because you have to keep calculating the hash that the hashes. So what they'll do is create rainbow tables where they've already computed the hashes and you're going to take the hash that you have and you're just going to use a program that tries to find the same hash in that file. Obviously, if it's a password that's so unique that there is no pre-computed hash for it because, you know, it's not a common password, then it's going to be a little bit more secure, right? So that's why we ask users to use longer passwords with different characters in them, right? Anything that makes it very difficult to either brute force attack that password or for it to already be a common password that's already been cracked that somebody can go and compare the hash. Okay, so that's basically how password and the shadow files work. And there's matching files for groups, right? Um, you'll find the same thing. You'll see a, um, obviously there's no passwords for shadow or for groups, right? But you'll find a group file where it has the, uh, the, the group name uh, it'll have the group ID and then all the members of that group will be listed in the group file. So you have something similar for groups. But again, this is it, right? This is about as, as complicated as it gets for basic Unix authentication. Usually you'll see this referred to as Unix authentication when we talk about the password file, right? It's the old fashioned way. Now, some systems do not keep a shadow file. They, the, the passwords are actually stored in the password file. Some legacy systems do that. Some legacy applications require that. There are some applications that try to use the password file directly, right? So they authenticate users or they check users using the password file um, directly. And that's how things all worked back in the old days in Linux, right? In Unix is if you wrote an application that needed to do some kind of authentication, it would use the password file directly to do that. Uh, those days are long gone. Most applications do not access the password file anymore.
it's all handled through PAM, which we're going to talk about later. So let's talk about privileges, right? This is the old uh, just change ownership, change group, and change mode command, right? This should be review from previous classes because you've probably already learned how to do this, right? You learn how to change ownership. You learn how to change your group and change the uh, mode of the file. In other words, the permissions on the file. Again, Linux is elegantly simple to set privileges for anything. You just set the privileges or permissions on the file that controls that thing, right? Whether it's a driver for a device or the network or files in a user's directory, it doesn't matter. They're all treated the same way. So it's very simple. Unless, of course, you're using ACLs. ACLs does complicate this a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to talk about ACLs in this class because it's not covered, but I may do a supplement on ACLs in a different video that won't be something you have to learn for the test. Um, one thing to remember about the change mode command, uh, sometimes they teach you with change mode, um, you know, these shortcuts for change mode, but uh, but just so you know what the, the real commands are, right? If, uh, you know, not every system is going to let you use the shortcut where you do user or schmod plus W username to add write, right? Or dash, you know, G dash W to add write to the group, right? For example. Um, so it's all really a, uh, it's kind of like, it basically, it's a bit um, uh, sort of like a, like IP addresses, right? It's a bit in each position. So the first bit is two to the zero, the second one is two to the one, and the third is two to the two. Of course, two to the zero is one, two to the two is two, two to the, uh, I'm sorry, two to the one is two, and two to the two is four, right? So it's one, two, and four. So you use ones, right, to set these. So if, if you have all ones, that's a seven, because four plus two is uh, six, plus one is seven, right? Gosh, doing basic math in my head here. Um, and then, so that basically set, it sets all the bits. So it's read, write, execute. Uh, if you just want read, write, that's going to be six, right? Because two plus four is six, zero, right? It's still six. If you want read only, it's going to be a four. You want uh, read and execute, it's going to be a five. If you want execute only, it's going to be a So hopefully you've already learned a little bit about privileges from your other classes. It should be review. Uh, first step I'm going to do to kind of play around with this, I'm going to uh, use the touch command to create a file just to see what happens when we create a file. Now, usually I do ls-al so I can see uh, the permissions as well as the file, you know, all the information about the file. If you just type ls, you're not going to see that. Uh, if you want to make this easier so you don't have to keep typing all that, you can do uh, alias ls equals and then do ls-al. Um, oh, whoops. I, sorry, I have to put a quotations around that. So if you do that now, if I type ls, it automatically shows all the information about the file. Um, incidentally, if you want to see what aliases you have, if you type alias, it'll show you all your aliases. So for example, ll also works. It's already an alias. And I'll probably use that one because it's got the color auto on it. So anyway, let me clear the screen so we can get rid of this junk. So I created my file. And if we look at, we see the file has been created. The default permissions are read, write for myself and then read for everyone else. And that's it, right? And you can see the folders, document and images, which was created by the user add command has a default of uh, read, write, execute um, for the owner and then eg execute and read for the group and then execute on, read and execute for everyone else, right? Um, we could change the permissions on a file using the schmod command, chmod, right? So if I wanted to give everyone access to that file, I could just do 777 file. And now you can see that file has access for everyone, right? And it changes it to green because I gave it execute access, right? When a file is executable, it changes it to green, the color. Um, now, how did those initial permissions get set? That's going to be the umass command by default. With umass 222 or 22 rather it's going to give me the default permissions of read and execute for everyone and my group and then read write execute for me so full permissions for me but i can also umass this so i don't have full permissions i can only read and execute right i can't write to the file or you know or something else right in fact one thing i could do is set my mask to 777 and now if i try to create a file watch what happens so i'll create a file one and now file one, you can see has zero permissions, right? No one has permissions to do anything with that file, um, which of course is not typically what we want, right? Um, so we want to remove file one, 
There we go. I spelled the file name incorrectly. All right, I'm going to change my U mask back, right? Because uh, that's not a very good U mask to have, right? 777. Uh, but I can also change the ownership of a file, right? So if you notice, I created a file, uh, but I created that file using the root account. So root is the owner and the, and the group is root. That means that the user who owns this directory, which is student2, is going to have a file sitting there that they can see, but they can't, you know, they might not be able to do anything with it because they're not the owner of that file. And of course they can because I gave them permission here. But, uh, but for example, if I change the uh, file to 700 file, right, now only I have permission to that file. The user, the actual person who owns this directory, isn't going to be able to do anything with it. So I want to change that to give that file to the user that is in this directory. So I'm going to use the chown command. I'm going to change the ownership to student2. Sorry, I spelled it wrong. And the file is just file, right? So now file is owned by student2, but it's still in the group root, right? Um, so we can use these commands to affect permissions for files. The important takeaway in this unit about permissions and privileges that I want you to remember, again, you probably already learned these commands in another class, which is great. So this is all just review. But the important takeaway is that everything in Linux is a file, right? It's all just files. Everything you do is files, right? Um, you know, even more advanced applications are all just files, right? It's all based on files. It's an elegantly simple way that Linux works. That means that even things like drivers and the network and so forth, they're all just files. So it doesn't have to be complicated. And what's important about that is you can restrict access to just about anything simply by restricting access to a file. If you don't want a user to have access to a, you know, a device, for example, you can set that, you know, the file that represents that device, you can set the permissions and it'll have that effect. So um, it is elegantly simple. now. Um, in your book, they show you the GUI, the Linux GUI, which we don't use the Linux GUI at all in this class. I, I really don't like using that in a Linux class because um, no one uses the GUI for Linux, right? Uh, no one uses it as a desktop. It's 99.999% of the time Linux is, you know, sitting in the corner somewhere and it's, it's, it's offering services on a network. And that's really how we have to be comfortable with Linux. Um, so I don't use the GUI, but in the GUI, they showed all these different permissions and privileges you could set. And really all that's doing is mapping to files on the, uh, you know, in the directories, right? That's all it's really doing. It's setting permissions to files. It's uh, now to some extent, some of that could be access control list. So there is a, a more advanced method of limiting access on Linux machines. You can use ACLs to do that. I'm not going to cover ACLs in this unit because it's really not covered in our textbook for one thing. Um, although in the real world, you will see ACLs. I'll probably make a supplementary video for this course where I'll teach you a little bit about ACLs, but I'm not going to make it an objective in this course. So I do want to talk about special permissions real quick. Again, your book talks about this in a little bit more detail, but the, the two important takeaways are the set user ID bit. This is really important. Anything that has the set user ID bit set is going to allow a um, uh, when a user runs that executable, right? So it's a replacement for the X, right? So when you look at you're looking in schmod, right? You run the ls-al command and it shows you the mode of all the files, right? It's going to have rwx, right? But instead of an x, you're going to see an s. And what that means is anyone who executes that file, it's going to run under the permissions of the owner of the file. So whoever owns that file and sets the set user ID bit, whoever runs it, it's going to run under the context of that user, which means if you have something where that bit is set and the owner is root. Whoever runs it is going to run under root. Now, this is required for certain utilities and certain programs. For example, the password command. You have to have this set because the password command has to be able to make changes to the password file. And if it's doing that under your context, if you're not root, it won't be able to do it, right? So it has to run under root context. What's important about this is that programs that you choose to run with this bit set, you have to make sure that they're secure, they're well-written, they're hardened, uh, you know, they're not going to be vulnerable to certain attacks, right? So you wouldn't want to just take any executable and add that bit. Sometimes it's it's tempting for users to say, well, let me add the set UID bit to my file so that anybody can run it under my context and then I know it's going to work, right? Um, and the other one is the SGID or set group ID bit. And this is really for shared directories. And your book talks a little bit more about this, but this is good from a security perspective because it does give you a little bit of flexibility on how 
files are handled in shared directories. So when people write to that directory, um, they can control their own files in that shared directory, uh, you know, and work with those files. And everybody, you know, like temp directories, for example, will sometimes use this feature and use the sticky bit feature. So again, your book talks about that, about that in a little bit more detail. I don't want to waste a lot of time talking about it in the uh, lecture here, but um, but in the next slide, I'll kind of show you what this looks like. So two things I want to show you here. First, I want to talk about the um, about the, uh, the 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 SUID bit, right? Um, so what that does is it allows you to run a command as the user that is the owner of the file, right? So let's take a look at an example of that. So if I look at um, Etsy, I'm sorry, uh, USR, which is where a lot of our commands are, bin, um, there's a whole bunch of files in USR bin, right? And some of these you're going to see that that S bit is set, right? The set UID bit is set. Um, to find one specifically, we know that, you know, the PASSWD command in your textbook talks about that one, right? There it is right there. It's, um, you can see that the, uh, you know, look for the S right between the W and the R in the uh, first four characters, right? It's the fourth character in, so dash R W S, right? So the S basically means that when you execute, it's not just execute, but execute as the, uh, excuse me, the owner of that file. Um, so what files have that bit set, right? Because here's the thing is that, that that bit can be dangerous because if you have a poorly written executable that could allow somebody to run it as root, for example, and, and have some vulnerability that allows them to then get access to things as root, that could be devastating, right? So it's good to know what things on your system have that bit set and the way you're going to do that. So I'm gonna just going to do forward slash. I'm going to search my entire system. So I'm going to find anything starting from root on the entire system. And the dash perm slash 4000 is basically going to return anything that has that bit set. So take a look at this list of files. You can see there's a bunch of different files that have that set UID bit set. Um, and most of them are probably going to run as root, right? Because look at the owner of password, right? If you look up there, uh, the owner of password is root, which means when you run that file, no matter who you are, no matter what user account you are, you're going to be running that password as if you're root. So whoever wrote that utility hopefully and i'm pretty sure the password command's been around for a long time right so they probably wrote it in a way to make sure that somebody couldn't run that command if they didn't have the right permissions and they can't try to take advantage of some vulnerability to try to run it run some other command with uh, with more permissions right all kinds of little tricks you can do to try to get around these controls and different executable applications so usually the applications that are going to run with that set uid bit are going to be written in a way that's going to be hardened against those types of attacks and there's a lot of little things you can do in your writing software to do that this course of course doesn't cover that type of thing but important to keep that in mind now the second topic i want to cover in this demonstration is failed login attempts right so often you're going to want to try to figure out has anybody tried to log into the system and take a look at that list of login attempts well if you type the last command it should give you a list of all of the previous login attempts you can see on this system um, these are all my my successful login attempts right so these are all the times that somebody logged in and it was successful right um, in most cases they logged in with ssh right um, so you can see that here that student is the most common one. So you know Brian underscore Green logged in on September sixth, and then you know you can see the different times I use this system uh, to do demonstrations and so forth, right? Now, what about the failed login attempt? Now this one's going to be a little bit different. If I run uh, last B, right, I get a pretty long list. Um, to make this readable, though, I'm going to hit Control C because it'll go on forever. I'm going to pipe it to the more command. That way I can see it one page at a time. It's going to start at the top with the most recent login attempts. So take a look at these failed login attempts. Somebody is using, somebody's trying to log in with, uh, with that student account, right? Um, just over and over and over again. So that's certainly con uh, concerning. Now what would be more interesting here, I'm going to hit Q to quit, is if we do last B dash A, because maybe it'll give me a little bit more insight, right? So now I can see exactly where student was coming from, right? So whoever is NS3021299 blah, 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 dot EU, right? Somebody in Europe, right? So I know somebody in Europe is trying to use that student account. And let's see some of the other accounts they're trying to hit me with, right? Um, yeah, all kinds of stuff, right? Whoever this is, is, is just trying everything, right? Now we see a couple other ones, right? Here's a 139 IP address where somebody's trying to uh, to log in and you'll see some things in here that are 
you know, like typical password accounts that people like Hadoop, for example, and MySQL, right? Those are uh, packages that people typically install. And there's probably some applications out there that when they install them, they create an account with that username and use some default password that's easy to guess, right? That, that a lot of different systems have. So people are probably looking for specific vulnerabilities here, right? And you can kind of see patterns of people trying. These are actively people trying to hack my system, right? This isn't something I made up, right? And if you do this on your system, this is kind of one of the fun things about us running in a class like this in a public cloud environment is our systems are open to the wide open on port S, on, on port 22 for anybody to try to connect and try to log in. So uh, anybody can try, right? And you'll just see these over and over and over again. Hopefully what you're realizing here looking at this is if you are, um, if you set up your student account with a poor password, somebody will guess it. Somebody will get into your system and they'll take over and then they'll start launching a denial of service attack using your system and Google's gonna shut your account down, right? Um, happens almost every semester I teach a class in Google Cloud, somebody will at some point contact me and say, hey, my machine, I'm locked out of it. Google shut down my account. Uh, then they see that they got an email from Google explaining that they're launching denial of service attacks and the reason is somebody compromised their server because they probably didn't pick a very good password for student. Um, so that's certainly something to uh, to be aware of and something that, um, you know, you want to make sure you have a strong password for sure. So I'll quit from that and we'll move on to the next section. So a little bit about PAM, PAM or the Pluggable Authentication Module. Um, you have all these different applications that need to do authentication, right? You can see in my list here the, at the top of this diagram, SSH, right? When you SSH to your machine, it has to authenticate you. Sudo requires authentication. Login D, of course, right? Because that's what logs you into the into the Linux machine. VSFTPD, which we installed earlier in the course, right? How did that know how to authenticate you? Well, all of those executables um, use PAM, right? So they use PAM. They, uh, the, the configurations for PAM are all in etsypam.d. Uh, I'm going to show you that in the next slide. So if you go into etsypam.d, you're going to see a file for every single executable that uses PAM for authentication. And what PAM does is when, when those applications do a call to libpam.so, it's going to then look at what executable is calling it and check to see what authentication modules it's going to allow for that application, how it's going to authenticate for that application. That application typically could either collect the user credentials or PAM's gonna do it on their behalf, depending on how it's configured. And then um, it's going to pass those credentials and do the authentication with, with whatever mechanism you have configured. Now, by default, you're going to be using the Unix password file, right, for authentication. That's the most basic authentication mechanism in Linux. But you could also configure PAM to do authentication with Active Directory, with LDAP, um, using uh, secure keys, using fingerprints, using smart cards like Improvada and stuff like that. So there's modules that you can add. That's what makes PAM important is that it's, it's modular, meaning that you can plug in different authentication mechanisms. And the cool thing about this is the various applications that need to do authentication, they don't care how authentication works. They don't care what you're using for authentication. You don't have to compile a special version of SSH to work with LDAP because it uses PAM and then PAM uses LDAP, right? So as long as PAM supports it, it's gonna work. Okay, so that's the important thing about uh, pluggable authentication module. It's really important. Um, it is by default the, uh, the, you know, the standard authentication mechanism that's used on almost every Linux distro uh, today. Most people don't, you know, in the old days, people would use Unix authentication directly. And if you wanted to switch to something like AD or LDAP and so forth, you had to install packages that would allow that. You might have to recompile um, applications to use that, right? It was a big pain in the neck. Those days are gone. PAM allows a lot of this stuff to happen. In fact, you may remember when we looked at VSFTPD, one of the configurations in VSFTPD was to use PAM. Um, and you'll see that a lot of the services that we work with in Linux will probably be working with a few more. This is not the last time we're gonna install things in this class. You'll probably see some other applications where they also have a configuration to use PAM. And when we use the yum command to install it, or if you're using Debian, it'd be apt-get or, or DNF or what have you, when after you install those applications, you'll see a config file in PAM D inside the PAM.D folder in Etsy uh, with that application's name and the various authentication mechanisms that it supports. So let's take a look at a demonstration of this.
So for our next trick, we're going to take a look at the uh, at PAM, the Pug Pugable Authentication Modules in Linux. And the first thing we're going to look at, and this is going to go relatively quickly, right? Because there's not a whole lot to configure here. But if we look in Etsy uh, PAM.D, you're going to see a whole bunch of files, right? Um, in fact, I'm going to switch this to LL because it's uh, nice and color coded, right? So when you look through, by the way, the, the ones in, uh, gosh, what is that? Magenta? That's not magenta. That's like aqua or something. But the bluish colored stuff, right? Those are links, right? We'll learn about links some other time. But the bottom line is this is a list of, um, of the configuration files. These loosely translate to the, um, the, the, the various processes that are going to use PAM, right? So what PAM really does is it, when somebody goes to log in, I talked about this in the lecture, right? When somebody goes to log in or use any application that requires authentication with, uh, you know, for, with the system, it's going to check this config file for that executable, right? And then it's going to see what authentication modules it's going to be authenticating against. And then it's going to carry out that authentication and then return control back to the application and let them know whether your authentication worked or not. It can even pass things about whether, you know, why your authentication failed, if it failed. Maybe your account uh, is timed out or, or, you know, it's past its expiration date or, you know, expired password or whatever, right? Um, so, for example, if you look in this list here, you're going to see SSHD is in here, the SU command, the sudo command. A lot of the things that we have to authenticate to use are listed in here. Um, and there is a file in here. Oh, yeah, and the PASSWD, right? Remember, that's the one that it runs as root, right? Um, so it, it, it can do its own authentication. But um, there is a, a, a file in here called system-auth, which is actually a link to system-auth-ac. And system-auth-ac is a file that uh, contains some of the authentication, um, the PAM, uh, uh, configurations, right? And one of those configurations is where to go find the file that sets our password policy. And it's probably the most important thing about PAM uh, is the password policy stuff if you're using PAM. By the way, PAM is the default, right? So when you install a Linux machine, by default, it's using PAM. So the login, for example, login D is using PAM to do your authentication. You can see that login is one of the items in this list. In fact, if I look at the contents of login, right? Um, so Etsy pam.d forward slash login, right? So if we take a look at that file, uh, those are the configuration modules that it's configured to use, right? Um, so it's definitely using PAM, right? When you try to log into the server, it's going to use PAM. Now, if you add a different authentication system, right? You want to use something different for authentication other than the built-in, you know, Unix authentication, right? So not the password file, right? You want to use something else. Um, in the old days, it was very difficult to do that without PAM, right? Because applications had to be compiled to use things like LDAP or Active Directory and so forth. But now, if you install a package that uses some other authentication mechanism and you configure PAM to understand how to use that authentication mechanism, any application that is configured to use PAM, uh, it passes that authentication all happens on the back end outside of its control. So they don't have to really compile to understand these different authentication mechanisms. So that's what makes it modular, right? But one of the settings that we could take a look at in here is the, um, is, uh, is the authentication, right? Or not authentication, I'm sorry, the password policy, right? So on any system, a really important variable to set is the password policy, control what kinds of passwords we can use. And you just saw why that's important because hopefully in the video you saw when I ran the last B command and saw all those failed login attempts, which by the way, are probably still happening, probably in the last couple seconds, you know, a hundred times somebody tried to log into my system, right? Um, so I wanna make sure that no one can set up a password that is not secure and a password policy is the best way to enforce that. So where do we find that file? So let's cd into etsy forward slash security. And inside etsy security, you're gonna see a bunch of files. One of them is going to be the pwquality.comp file. It's this third one from the bottom in this list, right? So you got time, supermit, right? Uh, uh, and then PW quality right above that. So let's take a look at that file. So I'm gonna use VI to edit that file. So it's pwquality.conf. Hopefully I spelled it right, which I did because I'm in. Um, you see a whole bunch of settings in here, right? A bunch of different things that you can set. So the first option, DIFOK, okay, this is gonna set the, um, um, how many times I can, or how many characters can be in my new password. Uh, 
that are not in my old password, right? So if I go to reset my password, I have to change at least five characters, right? Um, so that's the first thing. And then you have the minimum length of the password. Right now it's set to nine. Well, it's not set to anything really. See how these are all commented, right? So if I hit X on that, now it's no longer commented. So now it's gonna require nine characters for my password length, right? Um, D credit, let's see, that one is, uh, it's gonna require at least one number. Um, D for decimal, right? Uh, U is for uppercase, so at least it's gonna require at least one uppercase character. L is for lowercase, so at least one lowercase character. Uh, o is for, uh, gosh, what is it? Alpha, non-alpha numeric, right? So special characters like exclamation points and you know and so forth, right? So requiring at least one of those. Uh, the min, min class zero, uh, gosh, what does that one do? That's, um, uh, you need at least two classes of characters, right? So it says you have to have at least at least one upper, one lower, one digit, and one other, right? So at least two, that's how many of each of those classes, right? So if you set that to one, it's gonna require you have at least one of that list of characters. If you set it to, uh, to, to, to four, you have to have at least four characters in each one of those categories, right? So by setting it to one, that means you have to have at least one uppercase, at least one lowercase, at least one number, and at least one special character, right? So don't set that to too high a number, right? Because, you know, set it to an eight and people's passwords are gonna have to be a minimum of, you know, like 30 characters and no one will remember it, right? Which is, of course, a fine line. Um, max, repeat, uh, that's uh, to reject the passwords that have occurrences of four or more repeating identical characters, right? So if somebody used the same character more than X number of times, it's not gonna let you use it uh, and so forth. There's a whole bunch of other, um, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other settings in here, right? There's the GE COS setting, right? Um, yeah, we keep seeing GE in there, right? A little plug for my employer. But the um, point is, use this file to set the password policy, enforce the password file policy. It's a good idea to set it up. Uh, and you saw with all those failed password attempts, right? That's why we have password policies, right? Because uh, if, if we let people just set a password anything they want uh, and it's too simple, if it's a machine that's on the internet, somebody's gonna be able to break in, right? Somebody eventually is gonna pass that uh, or get the right password, right? It's like a million monkeys at keyboards. One day someone was gonna write, someone's gonna end up writing Shakespeare, right? Eventually somebody's gonna get that password. So now I'm gonna talk about a couple other authentication mechanisms in Linux uh, that are available for Linux. One is NIS, and I'm gonna talk about two, NIS and LDAP. And your book says, uh, you know, if you have to choose a mechanism, um, NIS if you must, but LDAP is better, right? Because NIS is kind of old and, you know, it's uh, not as secure. But in any event, if we go back in time in the old days, right? Let's say I had three servers on my network, the Whopper, Coleco, and MSA, right? These are my three servers. Um, each one of those might have a host file to manage how to connect to other servers, right? or other systems on the network. That's how I would control how to look things up. We haven't talked about DNS in this class, but you know this is kind of very basic DNS, right? Um, and I would have to set that host file on every computer that I want to allow host name resolution between other computers on the network. That's the first part. Um, now, let's say, um, you know, if I wanted to distribute this across my network, I would have to have that host file on every computer on the network. And I would, and, and you know, if I had to make a change to the host file, I'd have to change that host file on every single host file on the entire network, which is an administrative nightmare, right? Um, other files that would have to be synchronized in order for the entire network to be in harmony. The password file, so that everybody has the same username and password on every single machine. The group files, the protocol file, the network file, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, you know, the list goes on and on all kinds of things that we'd wanna synchronize across the entire network. There has to be a better way, right? Um, otherwise, we're gonna go nuts with system administration. So there is a better way, it turns out. NIS is the first one. So NIS basically gets rid of the host file and instead it tells you to use DNS. So you set up a DNS server and it manages domain names across the entire network and it automates that, right? So it's a lot better than trying to update host files all over the place. Um, the other piece is uh, NIS and LDAP can be used to manage all of the user accounts. And so I'm gonna talk about NIS and LDAP. They're both used typically for user authentication. Uh, they can contain email aliases. They can both uh, work in conjunction with DNS. 
Um, DNS is much better at this, right? We don't want to use NIS or LDAP for DNS. Then generally, it's better to use DNS for DNS, right? There's lots of packages uh, that, that do DNS a lot better than NIS or LDAP, but theoretically, you could use them. Um, so NIS is a Linux, Unix only technology. It doesn't work on any other operating systems where LDAP works with everyone, including Windows, right? So Windows actually supports LDAP. So you can use LDAP to log in on a Windows network, right? So, and to interrogate Windows about user accounts in a Windows network. So LDAP definitely has much higher level of interoperability. Now that said, there are packages for Linux that also allow Active Directory, native Active Directory. You can actually join a Linux machine to an Active Directory domain. I'm not going to get into that in this course. Um, this is obviously not an Active Directory course. It opens up a whole other can of worms, but I do want you to be aware that that's something that you can do. Um, and I may do an, a, uh, if, if, if you want to know more about that, ask me, um, uh, send me a, a message and I will create a supplementary video for you at some point. I may actually have one in my YouTube channel already that talks about how to do that. So NIS originally was developed by Sun Microsystems for the uh, their version of Unix, which is called Solaris. Um, they originally called it Yellow Pages, YP. So you're going to see in a lot of the commands for NIS, uh, YP, which is short for Yellow Pages, right? For those of you old enough to remember the Yellow Pages, it was a telephone book, right, where you could look stuff up, right? Nobody uses them anymore. But back in 1981, when they came up with this, right, actually, it was probably around 1986 when I think they came out with YP, um, yellow pages were all the rage, right? Everybody was still using the yellow pages. So NIS plus was later developed, uh, but it kind of sucked. Nobody really used it. Not even Solaris used it, right? Everyone kind of stuck with NIS. So it never really took off. LDAP though is much more common than NIS for sure. So NIS can centrally manage the Etsy directory stuff, right? So the password file, the shadow file, the group file, host file, services, networks, um, RPC uh, and so forth, protocols, all this stuff is centrally managed by NIS. And the way it does that is you set up an NIS server that is the master of all of these files, right? So it has an Etsy with all of this stuff and all the NIS clients or anyone who is a client computer on an NIS network, um, they basically get these files from that server to populate their own files, right? So they use them. These are kind of, they use the server's password file as a surrogate for its own. So when a user tries to log in on a workstation, it's not checking the password file native to that workstation. There might be one there, but it's not using it. It's using the one that is on the master, right? And there could be multiple masters, right? It's a, it's a multi-master database, essentially. Oh, and alias too. Um, so the required packages, you'll need YP bind, uh, which is for RPC port binding. You'll need the port mapper for RPC port mapping. Uh, if you haven't gotten the, the, the hint here, NIS is based on RPC. So it uses uh, um, remote, remote procedure call or RPC for all of its under the hood messaging uh, between clients and servers. Um, RPC actually was also used by Active Directory in the old days. Uh, it used RPC. They've transitioned away from that since uh, gosh, I think starting in like 2000, they started using their own mechanism, but RPC is still around, right? They still use it in uh, Unix for a lot of things and Linux for a lot of things. You'll need the YP serve package, which is actually the NIS server daemon, and then a bunch of tools, which are all the commands that we need to configure and work with NIS, like YP cat, YP password, right? So instead of typing the PASSWD command to set passwords, once you're set up with NIS, you'll use the YP PASSWD to set your password. The password command is useless once you start using NIS. I mean, you could set the local Unix password, but it's not going to help you if you're configured to log in with, um, if you configured login D to use NIS, um, YP which, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're going to use the YP password uh, command to manage groups and passwords and look up uh, groups and so forth. And uh, and we don't runs only on the master. All right, so configuration, there's a bunch of config files. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we're not going to set it up in this class. I'm not going to ask you to run it, but I do want you just to be familiar with the concept of NIS, that it exists and that we can use it. So I'll just bring this stuff up on the slide. It's going to be in my uh, in my copy of the slide deck that's in, uh, you know, that's in the course materials. So installing an NIS client, basically you have to install some packages. You still need YP bind, you still need YP tools and you need RPC bind. Uh, and then you're going to go into Etsy sysconfig network and you're going to set the NIS domain 
And then, uh, by the way, this is not the same as a um, as DNS domains, right? So this is distinct from DNS. Don't get this confused from DNS. But you're going to set the domain, and then, uh, oh, I guess it could be, right? Because you could use DNS with NIS. Um, you're going to use the etsyyp.com file to set some config options, like the IP address of your NIS server. Uh, and it can be a master or a slave that you configure it to use. doesn't really matter. Uh, and then you're done, right? So then your client is set up to use... NIS, after you install those packages and do the configuration, now you'll be able to use, uh, use that N NIS master or slave to do your authentication. If you want to change a password, the password command won't work anymore. Uh, it's only going to change the user's local password. So you're going to have to use the YP PASSWD command um, with the dash P, dash I, and dash F options. Um, to, if you want to remove or add users, you're going to have to do that on the master and just use the regular commands on the master, right? So from the master, the, basically the password file on the master is real, but the password files that are on all of your clients, um, they're not really being used anymore. It's using the password file on the master, right? Or one of the master's slaves. And when you configure a slave, the master is going to use RPC to push its password file changes out to all the slaves. Okay. So, so again, password command, not really useful anymore once we do this. So LDAP, LDAP is more common. Again, it, it works with Microsoft, right? Which right there, it's going to make it a lot more common. There was an old directory service protocol called X500 that LDAP basically replaced. What's the term directory mean? Directory really means a database, right? That's all it really is. So LDAP is nothing more than a database, but it just happens to be a database typically used for user authentication, right? It's a user database. It can store a much richer amount of information about users than the password file can, right? So it's definitely a much more robust option than using the Unix password files. It works across a network. You can use LDAP for authentication network-wide. Uh, it definitely has a lot of advantages over NIS. Um, in in uh, either Red Hat Enterprise Linux or Fedora or CentOS or any Red Hat distribution, uh, we're gonna use the open LDAP package to use LDAP. I believe open LDAP is also used in Debian. Um, it's going to use the Sleepy Cat Berkeley database. It's just basically a, uh, a, free, a free open source database engine. It's a very lightweight database, but it's a hierarchical database, right? So um, hierarchical meaning that the structure uh, Sleepy Cat is not tables that have relationships to each other. It's a, it's a hierarchical structure. Think of XML or JSON, right? It's a, very, it's a hierarchical data structure. I don't want to get into too much detail on how that works, but just understand that it's not a relational database. It's a different kind. And most, uh, most directories, when we use the term directory, they're usually a hierarchical structure. So Active Directory, for example, in Microsoft Windows is almost exactly the same as, as LDAP in that it's a hierarchical database. Now, of course, Active Directory has a lot of other stuff that it does. Um, you know, it's a pretty robust package, but um, but at its root, they're both hierarchical database, uh, hierarchical databases that are multi-master, meaning you can have many masters all synchronizing and replicating to each other. So it's uh, it's it's very scalable, and it's very it's uh, I don't want to say it's impervious to failure, right? But it's um, it definitely has a very very high degree of high availability, right, as compared to its cousins in the relational database world. Um, there are other uh, other hierarchical databases like Oracle and so forth um, that also is once owned by Sun Microsystems, right? So really kind of coming full circle here. NIS was started by, uh, you know, Sun Microsystems and was used in Solaris. And now OpenLDAP is also a technology that was developed by Sun Microsystems, right? Just a uh, different part of Sun Microsystems, the part that got bought by, you know, Oracle, which was bought by Sun Microsystems, but they all ended up under one roof, right? So funny how that works. So again, there, it's a hierarchical database. So no rows and tables. Uh, it's a group of objects. And what does this look like in reality? So let's say I've got a root uh, Drexel, right? And I, I teach a Drexel, so I like to use them as an example, right? Um, but you have what's called an entry. So an entry is basically key value pairs, right? So you have a key, which in this case is name, and then you have values within that key. So it's key value pairs that have a hierarchical structure. Um, so an entry contains or is defined in a schema. So what you can have in those entries in this hierarchical structure, so the structure of that hierarchy is defined by a schema. And schemas are um, basically 
defined by object classes. So basically you create an object class which defines what a schema looks like, right? So basically what are the rules about what you can, you know, these key value pairs um, and they can inherit from each other, right? So you can have an object class called person which inherits properties from student and also inherits properties from, or the other way around, right? Student inherits from person. You have a person and those properties are inherited by students and by faculty and by staff and so forth, right? And so when you create an entry, it's a key value relationship, right? So here the C is equal to Drexel. Within Drexel, there's China. At China, there's a CCI school. Then there's faculty and then a faculty member named Kim. Um, so that's what we refer to as an RDN. So an RDN is a combination of all of the attributes about an entry that make it globally unique across the entire database, right? So, so when you follow that tree, uh, that hierarchical structure, that tree, there always has to be some path down that tree that is globally unique, and that's the RDN. It's how we address things in a hierarchical database. It's how we reference things in a hierarchical database. You have to reference them by that global unique uh, uh, combination of, of hierarchical uh, key value pairs. Uh, as another example, so the location might be Philadelphia. The department is CCI. The organizational unit is student. And then the uh, the person's name is Sarah, right? So that could be an example of, you know, of an RDN, a combination of all those attributes. And again, those attributes, those, key val those keys and what are acceptable values are defined by the schema, which is really locked in by that object class and you can have collections of object classes to do that. You can see how this is definitely a lot more complicated than a traditional relational database, right? Uh, but in some ways it's actually a lot simpler as well because you don't have relationships. It makes it faster. It makes it much better at certain types of data, this being one of them, user accounts and networking and so forth. So if we want to get to Sarah, right? If I want to find Sarah, I have to, I can't just say Sarah to find Sarah. I have to define everything that's unique about Sarah. So I have to have all of Sarah's attributes all in combination in order to find her, right? And typically that's written like this. So we call that a distinguished name. So you're gonna see in the LDAP configurations when I show you the example, you're gonna see a DN or a distinguished name. I'm gonna use LDAP Explorer free tool. We're gonna to use the test it and you're gonna see that we have to enter the distinguished name and then the base name. So in this case, the base might be just Drexel, right? Um, and then the distinguished name is Sarah, student, CCI, Philadelphia, Drexel, right? A combination of all of those things. Um, it kind of looks like domain names, right? So you can see that this is starting to look a little bit like domain controllers in Windows as well. Windows uses really the exact same structure. They use the same vernacular. It works very similar, right? Um, all right, so. Let's talk about the LDAP vernacular. Some terms you're going to hear with LDAP. You've got a directory server, which is LDAP itself. It could also be Active Directory, right? A directory server. You have an entry, which is a single object within LDAP. So, for example, a user or a computer or a, um, a group or something like that. Those are all entries. And each entry is going to have attributes that are key value pairs. You also have a schema, which is basically defines what you can have in an entry. It defines that hierarchical structure. It's all defined in a schema. Uh, schemas apply to other technologies too, right? Uh, XML, for example, you can have schemas, right? Like XSLTs. Um, you have an object class, which is basically the schema, right? Uh, object class in LDAP is what defines a schema. And you have an RDN, which is the unique ID for any entry. It's the combination of all the attributes, the key value pairs that make something unique is the RDN. The distinguished name is uh, basically the parts of a, a fully qualified domain name, right? Is really a distinguished name, but it's all the parts that make up an RDN. That's how you basically show an RDN. It's the distinguished name. It's the full list of all those attributes with their value pairs. A DSC and a DC are the root entries. You're gonna see that in our configuration files. We're gonna basically create root entries. Um, so for example, Drexel is, uh, could in my example, or um, really in the real world, we do something like for the DSC, we would do something like Drexel EDU, right? As in Drexel.edu. Um, and then LDIF is, LDIF is a query language, just like SQL is the query language for relational databases, right? You have select statements and insert statements and so forth if you've taken a database class. If you haven't taken a database class, I highly recommend them. Database classes are great. You learn a lot of cool stuff. Um, but 
LDIF is a language unto itself. It's a language that's used to interact with an LDAP server. So in order to use an LDAP server on the back end, right? Now we're gonna use a graphical user interface to test our LDAP server, but to set up our LDAP server and to work with it directly, it's helpful to know some LDIF commands. I'm gonna give you some examples. I don't expect you to walk away from this class knowing LDIF and how to write your own LDIF commands uh, or, write, or know the LDIF, excuse me, the LDIF language, but at least we're going to have to use it to set up our machine. I'm going to give you some examples to do that. So to install LDAP, you're going to need some required packages. You're going to need open LDAP clients. You're going to need the open LDAP server. Um, so those are the two packages. And then you're going to configure your firewall on port 389. Uh, you only need port 636 if you're using uh, SSL, which we're not going to use in the lab. So we're just going to use port 389. So to configure your LDAP server, um, I'm going to go through all this stuff in my example, so I'm not going to talk about it in this, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not going to discuss it here in this slide, but, uh, but we're going to, but I'm going to show you how to do this in the, uh, in the real example. And of course, to test LDAP, you're going to query your server. Again, I'm going to do this in the example, but, you know, I'm just going to have this slide here so you can see it as a reference. Uh, but I'll give you these files that you're going to run. So you're going to see me run a bunch of commands. I'm going to give you a file that contains all of those commands so you can do this on your own. There's some utilities with LDAP. Um, I'm not going to cover it in this uh, class, uh, but you're going to see me use some of those material, uh, some of those utilities in the example. If you want to learn more about this, there's some links. I'm going to give you some links in the course materials as well. If you want to learn a little bit more about LDAP, but again, if you Watch my example and just follow step by step. You should be able to set up your LDAP server and test it. And, uh, you know, in the real world, you know, quite frequently you're going to be using Active Directory. And LDAP is about the closest analog I have to Active Directory that we can play with in this class without actually standing up a Microsoft Windows Active Directory. I didn't want to have to stand up AD servers, right, to show everybody how LDAP works. Uh, so instead we use Open LDAP to do that. All right, so we're going to do a little experiment here. We're going to try to use LDAP, right? We're going to try to set up LDAP and just to learn a little bit about how it works and see how to set it up, right? LDAP is basically a hierarchical database that is similar to Active Directory, right? Um, so for the first step, in order to, uh, to uh, use LDAP, you have to install it first, right? So you're going to use the yum command to install it. So I'm just going to copy and paste the command here that uh, that we're going to use. Um, and obviously I'll have these in the instructions, but uh, there's a bunch of components, right? So we're going to install LDAP and then a bunch of other things that you could possibly need with LDAP. We're not going to need a lot of this stuff, but we might as well install it just in case. So let me run that. Hopefully it goes out and finds it. And again, I'm running as root, right? To do all this, uh, that way I don't have to use the sudo command for each one of these. So it's going to go out and find all of our packages. It should ask me if I'm sure I want to install it. Almost there. So you can see mine is installing. All right, and it's done. So we've, uh, you know, when we install a service, the first thing we have to do is we have to try to start it, right? So system CTL, we've used that before, right? We know this is all about system D now in this class. Uh, and then we are going to enable the service so that it starts next time we start the machine up. Now I will give you a little tip here. Um, before you continue with this lab, I would recommend going into the Google console and taking a snapshot of this machine at this point. Because if you screw up from here, it's gonna be very difficult to unwind it. It's a little bit easier to start from here again. Uh, so, so please take my advice and make a snapshot of your machine at this point that way from here forward if you mess up you can go back to this step and whenever you take a snapshot so if you get into a you know if we do a complicated labs um, if you get to a certain step you know everything's working and you're ready to move on to the next step take a snapshot so you can always go back to that step later right you can just kind of go back in time to that previous snapshot it's a great great way to work through these labs uh, otherwise you could screw up and then you're like oh great i got to start from the beginning and reinstall my whole os and you know, and all that stuff, right? Nobody wants to deal with that. In fact, I make a snapshot of my machine every single week, uh, week to week. That way I always have, you know, kind of a hermetically sealed snapshot of an earlier week if I need to go back and do something from a previous week for a student or something like that. Um, all right, so the next step, we wanna make sure that 
LDAP is actually listening on the right port, right? The netstat command is going to tell us whether or not it's listening. And you can see here, uh, LDAP by default uses port 389, TCP port 389. We can see that it's working. Um, so that's good. We know it's working. So our next step is we have to um, set up a password um, for our... Uh, you know, for LDAP, right? To, to administer LDAP, we have to create a password hash, okay? So to create our password hash, you're gonna pass this command and you're gonna put your password. Uh, I'm gonna make my password something that I'm not going to forget, right? So I'm gonna make mine Camden CC, right? Nice and easy, right? Uh, just, you know, and again, this isn't something somebody's gonna be able to really log into from outside the network very easily, so um, not a big deal here, but that's gonna output a hash, right? So there's a password hash, and what you're gonna to wanna to do is copy that password hash. So if I'm using PowerShell, I'm just gonna highlight the characters that I wanna copy, and only the characters I wanna copy, no extra characters. I'm gonna right click, it's gonna go away, and that means that it's actually saved that hash. So now I can go and paste that hash somewhere, which I'm doing. So I just pasted that hash into a text file, so I have it to use later. All right, so for the next part, I now have to create a file uh, that we're gonna use to, imp and we're gonna import that file using the LDIF command. So LDIF is sort of like a, if you've taken a database class, LDIF is like a database language, but for LDAP, not for SQL, right? Most of us are familiar with SQL or Access or something like that, right? Um, you know, and running SQL cans in, in T-SQL or, you know, PL-SQL or something like that. But this is this is a database language that's specific for LDAP because LDAP, at its core, LDAP is really just a database. Um, but it's a database for authentication and user accounts, typically. It doesn't have to be. You could actually use LDAP for other things if you wanted to. Nobody really does, but you could, right? Although I say that, there's probably somebody out there that does. So I'm going to create a file and I'm going to call it uh, db. LDIF. So this is my data, my db.ldiff file. And I'm going to hit the I command. And in a text file, I've created the contents of this file, which I am going to paste in here, right? Now, don't worry, you don't have to write all this down. I'm going to give you uh, this file so that you can, uh, uh, you can just copy and paste it, right? You might have to change, you're going to have to change the OLC root password. That's the hash that we copy and pasted. So the very last thing you see in this file is what we copy and pasted from, uh, you know, from that uh, slap password command that we ran earlier, right? It's just like the PASSWD command, but it's specific slap is, you know, it's for the LDAP server. It's an LDAP hash. All right, so once I have this saved, so now I should have that file. Oh, I created it in this directory. I didn't really mean to do that. So I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I am going to make a directory under, um, I'm going to make it under student. So home student. And then I'm just going to call it LDAP. And then I'm going to uh, move this fold, this file. So db.ldiff. I'm going to move it into forward slash home, forward slash student, forward slash LDAP. Ah. And then forward slash db.ldiff is what we called it. All right, so that'll move the file and then I'm gonna change into that directory because I don't wanna run this from, uh, you know, this config directory. Hopefully you didn't make the same mistake, right? All right, so now there's my, my db.ldiff uh, file. So the command to basically, uh, to get that file inserted into my database, right? To initialize my, I'm basically initializing the LDAP database with that series of commands in that text file. And it worked, right? So it created my database with some basic configs, including that password, Camden CC, right? Which I'm gonna remember, right? I'm not gonna forget that file. I have to create another one. So the next file I need, which is gonna have some more commands is uh, monitor.ldiff. And again, I'm gonna copy and paste some stuff in here. I'm gonna just show you a little bit in here um, as far as what we're, what we're actually doing here. So in this file, notice that the, um, in that third line, the very last line, I guess it's the fourth line down, you can see the, um, um, there's a, a base DN, right? The base DN is basically the user account that is the administrator for this database, which is basically gonna be LDAP admin at CIS 285.local, right? 
So my my um, database server, and I didn't show you this in the previous file. If you go look at db.ldiff, you're going to see that the the root um, the root DN is l is is uh, cis 285.local, right? So that's my root DN. If you remember from the the lecture where I talk about CNs and DNs and all that, right? So the root domain name essentially is cis 285.local. Um, and then my, my administrator for that domain is going to be LDAP admin, right? So this is where I'm basically setting up the administrator user account um, for my server. So let me go ahead and save this. And then I should be able to run the command that's going to um, initialize those settings for me. It looks like that's done, right? So it created that account. So now I have to basically, um, the next step really is there's this, you have to create schemas. And the schemas are basically how you, it's basically the structure for user accounts, right? What kinds of things I can store about user accounts and about people, right? So just like in a database, you create tables with columns and you define what those table names are and what you can put in the different columns, right? If you remember from a database class, I'm sure some of you have taken one. Um, but basically, you have to define a schema. So in order to do that, we're gonna, luckily they give us a, uh, oops, let me copy this command. So they give us some files that we can use um, as, our, as our default schema. And in fact, if I look at where this copied my, my schemas, let me take a look here. Um, let's see, actually, I think, uh, I shouldn't have run this all in one command. I should have paid attention here, sorry. Uh, it looks like it worked though. Um, yeah, this did work. Okay, so if I look, there's gonna be in the folder uh, var lib ldap, right? So let me just take a look at the contents of that. So if we look in var lib ldap, that's, this is where we copied the uh, files. Uh-oh, I don't see any files in there. Let's see if there's some files in, uh, let's see, in Etsy forward slash open LDAP schema. Oh yeah, here we go. See, these are all the default schema files. So we're gonna run some of these defaults. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna basically use those default schemas. So somebody already went through the work to create a schema that kind of looks like a user management system. So it has a place for us to store, you know, information about user accounts and so forth. Now this should work if I just go ahead and uh, run the three commands, which I just did, right? So that ran those commands that creates the default schema. So now I've got a database that I initialize. I have the schemas all set up. I have to create another account that basically is going to create the LDAP manager account, right? So basically it's going to create the um, the account for the uh, for the administrator of, or not only the administrator, right, but also groups. I'm going to create two groups with this LDIF file. So first, we have to use VI to create this. It's going to be base.ldiff, and we're going to have to insert into this file. And I'm going to copy and paste some more stuff in here. Again, you'll have these files as part of the lab. So you can see here we have a uh, for in C in, in CIS 285.local and uh, in that in local we have the LDAP admin account which is the LDAP manager and then we're also creating um, two groups we're going to create a people uh, group and a group group right um, well a people is a uh, is sort of like an OU um, and then group is like a group in active directory right that's the basic idea we're trying to kind of approximate what active what active directory looks like essentially here so let's go ahead and run this. This is gonna create our groups and our OUs, right? Just two basic ones. So in order to add this, add those accounts, I have to put my LDAP password. If you remember, mine was Camden CC, and it worked, right? Now, if it didn't work, chances are you probably typed the password in wrong and you'll have to try it again, but make sure you get the right password. Uh, so all of that hinges on, you know, you having copy and pasted that slap password in. Now for the last part, we're going to create a user account, right? So we're actually going to create a user account in LDAP. Um, 
and you'll kind of see this looks a little bit like the password file, right? We're kind of approximating the, the schema that we used really has a schema that makes it seem like it's a password file, right? Um, so it has like all the same elements that a password file would have. So let's, uh, let's use VI again. And I'm gonna create an account called Brian. You're gonna create an account using your own name, of course. So let me copy and paste a file that I have here. All right, so you can see here we have, it's Brian who is in the uh, OU of people and it's in the cis285.local domain, right? So my UID is Brian, because that's who I am. And then the uh, CN is Brian, the UID is Brian, my UID number is 99999, my group ID number is 100, um, home directory is home Brian, login shell has been bash. This is starting to look familiar, right? Um, this is all the stuff from uh, from the password file, right? Um, except password you can see there is really not set to anything. It's crypt X, which really means nothing, right? There's no password set. Uh, and that's pretty much it, right? So we're gonna create this account. So let me hit escape and save that file. And now we're gonna go ahead and try to add Brian to this file. Now in order for this command to run, I'm gonna have to put my password in and it worked, right? Added the account. The next thing I need to do is set that password for that account, right? So easy way to do that. I'm gonna run this command. Notice that the dash P, the S, right? So the dash S section right here where it says password one, two, three, that's the password that I'm setting. So I'm setting my user accounts password to password one, two, three, my LDAP user account. And then the uh, I'm running this command as LDAP admin, right? So that's why you see LDAP admin here. That's That's the, uh, persona in which I'm running the command, but the account that I want to affect is Brian people CIS 285 DC local, right? So that's the account. So I'm setting the password for Brian, but I'm doing so using the LDAP admin account. So when it prompts me for a password, it expects me to put the password in for LDAP admin, not for Brian, right? So LDAP password in this case, it's going to be Camden CC, and that's it. Right, so now I have set up my new user account. And as an example, I can search LDAP using this command and it's gonna go and find that account that I created, right? So I did a search against LDAP, found my, my user account. And if I wanted to, I could uh, you know delete that account if I wanted to, right? But for the next part of this, what I wanna do is um, I wanna actually test LDAP, right? And see if it works from outside this machine. So in order to do that, I'm gonna to have to set up my firewall. So I, I'm gonna take a look at this machine. The machine I'm using this week is week four, right? So if you clone the machine, it's not gonna clone the firewall rules. So you're gonna to have to set that firewall. So I'm gonna go in here and click edit and I'm going to add a network tag and I'm gonna call it CIS-285 week four. Right. All right. So now I've got week four set up as a network tag and I'm going to save that. All right. With that saved, I am now going to go into my uh, network settings. Right. So I'm going to go back up here to the hamburger. I'm going to go into network services or I'm sorry, uh, VPC network firewall. So there's all my firewall rules. I'm gonna create a new firewall rule. I'm gonna call it uh, CIS 285 LDAP. Um, I should probably put some dashes in there just to make it more readable, right? It kind of annoys me sometimes and I forget to do that. Um, all right, so the network is the default network priority. That's fine, it's an inbound rule. I'm going to allow uh, my target. I'm going to specify target tags and it's gonna be CIS 285-week4, at least I think that's what it was. My IP range is going to be 0, .0, .0, 0, .0, 0, 0 forward slash zero, right? Because I just wanna allow all IPs. I don't need a second filter. And for the TCP port, LDAP uses port 389, so I'm gonna set it to 389. 
and I'm going to go ahead and create that rule. Now I'm just going to double check that I put the right network tag in because I can't remember if that was the right value. I probably should have copy and pasted it. So I'm going to go back over here to, um, to my compute engine, to my VM instances. I'm going to click on CIS 285 week four. And I'm just going to check the network tag. CIS dash 285 week four. I was afraid of that. I think I, I had it wrong, right? So you get to see this a second time. So I'm going to go back over here to my uh, VPC network firewall. I'm going to edit this rule. I'm going to add the right tag here. Get rid of the wrong one, right? And that's it. So now 280, uh, 389 should now be open to the correct machine. Now, if you recall, we can't just update the firewall in Google. We also have to add the rule to the firewall in uh, firewall CMD, right? Which we looked at previously in this course. There is a service called LDAP, which will open port uh, 389. So this should work. If we run this command, you can see it's success. And now we just have to do a reload of the firewall. I'm gonna copy and paste that command in here just because it's faster. And uh, that should reset the firewall. So now we should see that port 389 is now open. So to test LDAP uh, on a Windows machine, you can install this little uh, tool called LDAP Explorer. So I'm just gonna click next. There is one available for Mac as well. So there's a version of this that works on a uh, on a Mac and it kind of works the same way. I'll show you how to set this up. It's very simple though. So I'm just gonna install this very simple utility. I'll give you the file in, um, I'll upload the file into Canvas so you'll have access to the file. Um, but I'm just gonna click next. I'm gonna launch. Oh, I don't wanna create a quick launch. Uh, go ahead and install it. Take a second here to install. It's pretty straightforward. All right, I'm gonna launch the tool and I'll drag it over here so you can see it. So here's the tool. And basically I'm going to go into my configurations. I'm gonna create a new, let me show you what I did here. So I'm gonna click on the new button to create a new configuration. I'm gonna call it CIS 285. I have to put in the IP address for my server. So I'm gonna put the public IP address in. I'm gonna leave the port set to 389. Um, that's, that's what I want, right? Test my connection. I have to put my password in. Camden CC, right, is what I used. Oh, invalid credentials, right? So I probably have to modify the credentials. Also, I can also try. Oh, didn't like that. So we're going to stick with three. All right. So for the user DN, um, actually, one of the cool things down here is you can hit uh, guess value and it will. Uh... Oh, let me try my password again. And it'll try to guess it, but of course it didn't work. We're not gonna use SSL. Uh, so the user DN is going to be Brian. Um, and then the base DN. And actually we're gonna get this from that config file that we used. So at the top, you're, you're gonna use your LDAP admin. So it's CN equals LDAP admin. Probably don't want that space in there. And then uh, DC is CIS 285, DC equals local, right? I, uh, I use the store password option. So I put my password in. Remember mine was Camden CC with capital C's. And then down here, guess value actually will probably work. But if not, you just put in DC equals CIS 285 comma DC equals local. If you hit test connection, it should say test okay. And once you do that, you're gonna click on the one that you created, click open. It's gonna connect and you can see over here, here's my root. Right, I've got people, I've got a group with no one in it, but I've got my people group. And if you recall, we created an account in there called Brian. And if I click on that, I can go over here to the right side and I can see all the settings. So for example, I could see that my GUID number was 100, my login shell has been bash, my home directory is home Brian, right? And all this other stuff that we configured. So it worked, right? We're able to access LDAP and that's it. So that's, uh, that's week four.